get started today, and um, we're going to be talking today about gene therapy and what the latest advances are, both um, with the three fellows talking today, and we'll go from the basics to surgical approaches to, I think, the social and economic uh, impacts of gene therapy. So it's coming to retina. We're going to be leading the way, and I'm going to let Nico start. Okay. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so, again, welcome to the Retina Grand Rounds presentation. So we're excited to give you an update on a gene therapy for retinal diseases. So we have a lot of interesting topics uh, to cover this hour, and uh, really what I'd like to uh, have you guys is hopefully learn about what, uh, um, you know, what is gene therapy, you know, all the important um, advancements leading to the approval of the first gene therapy for retina um, uh, called Luxterna. Uh, then I'll give you an update on the ongoing trials of uh, gene therapy in choroideremia and other inherent renal diseases. Um, and then lastly, I'll give you an update on the clinical trials uh, for gene therapy in AMD uh, and end with the future perspective of uh, gene therapy and genetic eye diseases. So let me start with some basic definitions. Um, uh, inherited renal dystrophies, or IRDs, are associated with genetic defects causing progressive uh, retinal degeneration. Uh, these typically cause severe bilateral vision loss beginning early to midlife. Uh, we have uh, several prevalence studies, and in the UK last year, the most prevalent of the IRDs is uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, or RP and accounts for more than 50% of all IRDs in the UK, about 10,000. Uh, this is followed by Usher syndrome, which is a syndromic form of RP, uh, then Sargard disease, and then the fourth is Leber congenital amaurosis. <clears throat> According to the WHO, genetic eye disease is a priority eye disease, uh, but there's no global statistics to evaluate for burden of visual impairment from uh, genetic causes. Causes. One of the reasons is that it's uh, difficult to diagnose uh, inherent retinal diseases um, in a large population studies, uh, which is unlike cataracts, where you can just come in and uh, do a quick uh, slit lap exam uh, to have a screening. Uh, there are uh, several studies uh, throughout the years. One was uh, last year in 2019, a real population study. Uh, that screened about 15,000 people in, um, in, uh, in Germany and showed that up to 14.5 of what they've defined as uh, having a visual, visual impairment or blindness came from a genetic eye disease. You know, just to give you a sense, you know, 20% was uh, uh, for AMD, um, another 20% for cataracts, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, it's a high number. Other studies show that an incidence of genetic eye disease to be one in 2,000, and uh, uh, we also know that it is one of the leading cause of vision loss in the age group of 15 to 45 years old. One of the earliest onset and rapidly progressive of the inherent renal dy dystrophies is uh, Leber congenital amaurosis caused by mutations in the RPE65 uh, gene. Um, uh, this is a rare disorder. This is uh, uh, fundus photographs of uh, one of our patients with RPE65. We, uh, we only have two. Uh, that we take care of here at the Moran uh, this, of a 49-year-old. This is a 49-year-old uh, female that had visual symptoms by 10 years old and currently has a, a vision of a light perception in both eyes. And you can see that she just has a severe uh, retinal uh, diffuse atrophy in both eyes. So in December of 2017, FDA approved Luxterna or Voredigine uh, Neparvovec for the treatment of RPE65 um, associated retinal degeneration. And uh, the results of the uh, phase one and three trials were just published a couple of months ago, uh, last fall. And some of the inclusion criteria for the study um, is that the patients need, of course, a confirmed genetic di diagnosis of biallelic uh, RPE65 gene mutations. Again, this is an autosomal recessive disease. Uh, they've treated patients as young as three years old and older. Uh, visual acuity should be 2060 or worse in both eyes. Um, and then the patients had subretinal, so that's important, subretinal injections of the normal copy of human RPE65 carried by a viral vector called AAV2 or adeno associated virus uh, 2. Uh, and Chris will talk more about the technique for subretinal injections or other uh, modalities for uh, delivery of gene therapy. 
These studies included uh, sites at Philadelphia as well as the University of Iowa. Now, one of the key endpoints for the study is improvement in the MLMT uh, score. And in contrast to how we measure uh, visual function with visual acuity, um, uh, or even, uh, for example, in ERGs, uh, MLMT uh, measures functional uh, vision. Uh, I think I think this is a very important um, uh, thing to 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 know. So I'll, I'll show a quick uh, two minute video. If it works. Beginning with a 5 by 10 foot grid, we created a path of arrows for individuals to follow as they make their way through the course. We added objects of varying height and contrast to simulate everyday obstacles. For example, a pool noodle. This represented an ankle height obstacle such as a tree root. We also used a lab stand with a foam circle on top. Depending on the individual's height, this served as a knee or hip height obstacle such as a bush. There was also a stop sign, which served as a head height obstacle and was adjusted according to each individual's height. Blank squares represented holes in the ground, synthetic grass as grassy patches, and raised blocks to mimic a step, such as a curve. Additional obstacles were added using objects around the lab, making a total of 15 obstacles throughout the course. To more accurately reflect the real world, we specifically chose seven different lux levels for the MLMT, which is what sets the MLMT apart from existing mobility tests. The lux levels defined as standardized light levels were specifically chosen to represent commonly navigated environments in the real world. The seven lux levels range from one to 400. 400 lux, the brightest level, was similar to an office setting. 250 lux mimic the interior of an elevator. 50 lux, an outdoor train station at night. 4 lux was equivalent to a parking lot at night. And finally, 1 lux, the darkest level, a moonless summer night. Flux level was assigned to score code. Score codes were used to quantify results, along with accuracy and time to completion, which will be explained later on. Okay, so that's uh, the MLMT. So the results of the phase uh, three uh, clinical trial for uh, Luxturna showed improvement in MLMT score. So what's shown here are the individual patients. Uh, for example, in um, the first, uh, you know, the first patient, age five years old, had an MLT M uh, T score of five and showed improvement to, you know, uh, um, uh, to MLMT score of uh, uh, six. Um, and this is all tabulated. And as you, as you can see, most of the, all the individuals had an increasing MLMT score. And uh, that the results also show that the MLMT uh, improvement is durable up to four years. Um, and so this is how long the study has been going on. And, um, uh, and uh, it is still, the observational study is still ongoing to see how long really we can keep, uh, 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 keep this. 
Uh, the other big question for gene therapy that this trial answered is the safety profile for uh, subretinal injections of AAV2 with, uh, with a RP65 gene. There were in a lot of initial concerns of immune response to viral particles that may cause uh, unwanted uh, immunological responses or retinal toxicity issues. Um, and the phase three data show that the safety profile of the procedure um, uh, is consistent with just the risks of having a vitrectomy. Um, it, I boxed here in red uh, the cases of eye inflammation. There were three. Uh, two were not severe uh, inflammation. Um, uh, one was a case of endophthalmitis, uh, which is a known complication of uh, any uh, intraocular surgery. So what's on the pipeline now that we have Luxterna um, uh, approved? You know, the next disease that will be uh, coming is um, uh, for gene therapy is choroideremia. This is an X-linked recessive disease uh, with mutations in the CHM or uh, REP1 gene. This is a, a photo of one of our uh, patients with a, a choroideremia. As you can see, has extensive atrophy as well. So the phase two um, a trial, uh, the 24-month results were just published a, a couple of months ago. Um, and like Luxterna, the Luxterna trials, uh, this uses an AAV2 REP1 um, uh, uh, viral vector. And they have uh, uh, injected subretinal injections in six male patients, uh, more adults ages uh, 32 to 72 years old. And what they've showed that uh, in the initial trial is that 90% of the patients shows um, improvement of uh, best corrected visual acuity uh, by at least um, 15 letters, or I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, that 90% of patients in 24 months did not have a decline in best corrected visual acuity, and about 21% have improved um, uh, 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 visual acuity of 15 letters. And this is... Uh, compared to the natural history study, which uh, predicts or, or shows that only 1% uh, of untreated patients um, have any uh, uh, improvement in uh, visual acuity. <clears throat> so this, uh, this trial is being conducted by Biogen, which uh, acquired Nightstar last year. They have a phase three call, uh, study called the STAR study. It's a randomized mass prospective uh, clinical trial with 170 adult males. And uh, based on the phase one, two data, the primary endpoint is improvement of uh, best corrected visual acuity of at least 15 letters in 12 months. Again, a little different from the Luxerna trial where one of the endpoints is the MLMT uh, improvement. Uh, and they have completed enrollment just in uh, November of 2019. So we're excited to see the results of that hopefully in the next year or so. Now, you know, we've talked about Luxterna for RP65, then croideremia, but there's a lot more clinical trials for gene therapy in other diseases. This is just a partial list of what's being targeted right now. Some things that I'd like to highlight includes uh, ABCA4 for Stargardt, as well as RPGR mutations in um, X-linked RP. Uh, another thing that I'd like to draw your attention, maybe it's very hard for you to see, um, but for CHM, they use the AAV2 virus. Um, you know, for uh, the um, RP65, the AAV2 virus, but there's newer studies now that are using other um, AAV viruses, including AAV5 uh, and 8. So I just wanted to give you just a, uh, just a quick teaching point on adeno-associated viral vectors. So we, there's, there are uh, 12 known serotypes of AAV, and these can all transduce RPE cells. These viruses, 2, 5, 7, 8, and 9, can transduce photoreceptors, and this is what, which is why AAV2 has been popular because many of the inherent retinal diseases has genetic defects in photoreceptors and not in RPE cells, and it's just uh, kind of the workhorse uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, for our glaucoma colleagues, a, um, uh, it's interesting that AAV2 can also transduce retinal ganglion cells. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, again, the, our glaucoma colleagues are interested in that. The, the newer AAV viruses, including AAV7 and AAV8, have altered capsids that allow greater transduction of photoreceptors just with intravitreal injections. So, so this holds promise of intravitreal injections uh, with a virus going through um, all the barriers and getting into the photoreceptors. And uh, I mentioned RP, uh, RPGR for X-linked RP, and uh, it's been reported um, uh, that this is the strategy that they're um, uh, doing, and they have a natural history study, which we're also, uh, um, which the Moran is uh, participating in. 
So to add to the complexity of gene therapy, there are multiple strategies to how to correct uh, ge genetic defects. You know, the strategy for RP65 and CHA mutations are similar, and it's to introduce a normal functioning gene inside um, uh, cells that have a bad functioning gene. Now, uh, there are other strategies, including genome editing or correction therapy. And one of the clinical trials that I'd like to talk about is this, um, our uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10 ca uh, caused by CEP290 mutation and how this is done. Uh, this is one uh, that I'm particularly interested in. Um, uh, so there's, there are mutations in the gene called CEP290 that causes uh, aberrant uh, splicing of MRI, mRNA causing mutant protein. So the mutation is intronic and causes splicing uh, problems uh, uh, causing decrease in uh, uh, the protein, uh, uh, translation of protein. Uh, they've used an antisense oligonucleotide, which is just a chain basically of nucleic acids that bind to the mutation and redirects for normal splicing of uh, CEP290 mRNA making normal protein. So uh, the ProQR, uh, Pro uh, the uh, company ProQR has a phase one to uh, tri trial at Iowa, Pennsylvania and at Ghent University in Belgium studying intravitreal injections of this oligonucleotide fragment. So again, this is just the intravitreal injection of um, cipofarsin or QR1110, 110, uh, which is the, the fragment. <clears throat> The, the phase one, two concentrated on a dose range finding, and the 12 month results of the study was just uh, reported back in October 2019. It's not published, but on a press release, they've shown uh, improvements in uh, uh, best corrected visual acuity, as well as they've used a mobility course and showed some improvement in a, a mobility course. Uh, there is now a phase two, three Illuminate trial that will enroll 30 patients, and they've started enrolling uh, now. So. Uh, you know, I've talked about a lot about inherent renal diseases, so a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, but, uh, you know, a bigger market and, uh, and uh, what people are doing are also gene therapy in AMD. And I'd like to um, talk to you about two trials on AMD using gene therapy. The first is the phase one optic trial by Adverum Biotechnologies looking at ADVM022. This is a two-year multi-center perspective trial. This is an intravitreal injection of AAV7. Um, with uh, aflibercept, or uh, uh, we know it more with Ile the name Ilia, in patients with wet AMD. And these patients were previously treated with anti-VEGF injections. Mm -hmm. They have uh, enrolled six patients for the study, and the 24 up to 34-week data uh, was presented in AAO just in October 2019. And interestingly, these patients, uh, prior to enrollment of the study, was, were getting, you know, uh, almost monthly injections of ILEA, and after one injection, maintained visual acuity with ha without having any rescue injections for this study. Um, and so, really, uh, gene therapy for this uh, for, uh, for AMD has a prospect for susta sustained anti-VEGF uh, release without need for monthly injections. The, the second trial is Regenex Bio trial. And in contrast to the last trial, this is a subretinal injection of AAV8 with an anti-VEGF fab protein, uh, also for wet AMD. Phase one and two results were also released in October 2019. This is a dose-dependent response uh, a trial. And the highest concentration uh, show, led to almost uh, a quarter of the patients being injection-free uh, at five to six months. So kind of a similar conclusion to the first study. Uh, and they're gearing up for a phase 2B for wet AMD, as well as also targeting um, uh, for diabetic retinopathy. Um, Chris will mention a little bit, but there's also other strategies for uh, delivery of viral uh, of, uh, of genes uh, to the retina. And uh, one such uh, delivery is supracoroidal uh, delivery that can be done um, in clinic. So on, in summary, since approval of Averdegene and Parvovec, uh, many clinical trials are underway to treat IRDs with gene therapy. AAV vectors are improving and gives us uh, different platforms for gene delivery, including subretinal and intravitreal. Gene therapy in AMD uh, is promising uh, to be able to decrease the burden of injections in clinic. Uh, some of the future perspectives and knowledge <coughs> gaps that I just like to leave you with, you know, uh, it's a very exciting field, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for epidemiological studies. Um, we still really, uh, as I've mentioned, we don't know the visual burden of IRDs, and uh, people think that uh, it's uh, really uh, grossly underreported. And uh, one of the ways it could be uh, for a population screening using handheld full-field ERGs. 
In genetics, yeah, we can, there are, is still a 30% uh, negative rate for suspected uh, people with genetic eye disease. So we haven't found all the mutations, we haven't found all the genes yet. So still a lot of work that needs to be done um, in that field. Um, and then lastly, molecular mechanisms for inherited retinal diseases. You know, we, we still need to understand pathways to better understand the role of modifier genes uh, that modulate the clinical phenotype. So what do I really mean by that? You know, what I mean by that is that these are all um, uh, photos of uh, what, we, what we would have called Stargard disease. Uh, they all have ABCA4 associated retinal dystrophy, but as you can see, the clinical phenotype um, uh, uh, can go from uh, uh, very mild to very severe to the right. Um, the other thing is, you know, uh, similar phenotypes, and this is Stargard disease as well, are very, very similar but can have different mutations. This is an ABCA4 mutation and ELO-VL4 mutation. So we need to really start thinking about these diseases, not kind of uh, how we think about traditional um, a phenotypic uh, diagnosis, but uh, we really need to think about these as molecular diseases. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. We're going to, any quick questions while Chris is setting I up? I just have one. Yeah. The AB7, the one in AMD that you said, what, did they thought, did they think that was targeting Mueller cells or what? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I know that there's some non-specificity for these things, but I, in, in their, in their trial, there's animal models that basically show that, but it's hard to show that for yeah. human trial. Yeah. Yes. I just want to clarify one of the basics here like, about the cell cycle. So the um, cells that are getting transduced are these replicating or they're lasting a lifetime? What is the cycle there? Yeah, so you know these retinal cells are uh, terminated or uh, fully differentiated, so they're not replicating. Um, and so the thought is, you know, you introduce uh, gene therapy inside these, you know, like photoreceptors and stay there. We don't know how long they could last, you know, and that's why, you know, the Luxor trial shows that it can last up to, <coughs> its effects may last up to four years. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, if there are more questions, if we have time, we'll go through them. Nico will be available. Chris will talk about surgical approaches to gene therapy. Thanks, Nico, for that. Yeah. Great uh, talk. So, to start off, does anyone know how many surgeons were involved in the initial phase three clinical trial that led to FDA approval of Luxterna? I'll give you options, two, five, 10, or 20. Two. So when I was asked to talk about this, something that's very technical and not a lot of people have done, I, I had to rack my brain of how best to approach it, and uh, I went with the theory of find people with white hair, no hair, or white hair and no hair. And, uh, and there was this article that was published last, uh, a few months ago that is a really good review, and I'll be citing it heavily. So for the residents, what's the first step in subretinal gene therapy with a patient? Yeah, so preoperative eval, great. So it's, um, what they recommend is that we first select candidates by phenotype. You then confirm that by genetic testing. Um, so we don't just do genetic testing, and if you have a genetic mutation, even if it's not the right phenotype, don't treat that with gene therapy. You're going to do multimodal imaging. You're going to assess with micropermetry to find the favored fixation point for the patient, and then you're going to have a very detailed informed consent. And it's notable to say that if they do gene therapy now in a trial, they might not be able to be in any other trials later on, so you might be closing the door for them in certain ways. Um, in terms of what you start before you're actually doing the procedure is they recommend treatment with oral corticosteroids at one milligram per kilogram for three days, and then they're going to be on a post-operative taper of them. You have to have the vector prepared for you. So this isn't something like an ILEA that sits just in the refrigerator. This is something that is prepared by the company and then sent to you. Once it arrives in your office or in, in your pharmacy, there is a viable use period so there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen between the pharmacist, the surgeon, and the patient to make sure that the timeline is all set up correctly. Uh, the pharmacist needs to be involved early and needs to have the appropriate protocols set up. And you need to inspect the vector, not just for contamination, but they had even examples of um, the wrong vector being mailed. And so you want to make sure that you're putting the correct vector in the correct patient, and you want to note the expiration time. I'm going to go through this real quickly, but Notably, there's a lot of stuff you need, which this is my favorite slide, because as Dr. Shakur knows, I'm, I'm a gear junkie. 
But um, in terms of what's specific for this is you need intraoperative OCT. Doing subretinal gene therapy without it is not going to be very successful. And they recommend with the Zeiss system using Callisto. Callisto allows the assistant to control the focus and the position of the OCT. If not, you have to toggle back and forth as the surgeon on the scope. And when you toggle onto the OCT focus, you're not controlling the microscope focus anymore. Um, and the other interesting thing is using subretinal needles. It's a 23 gauge outer lumen, and then the inner lumen's a 41 gauge subretinal needle. And they have different ones for different points of the procedure. You want to select an injection site. Um, this is a normal picture, but these patients aren't going to be normal. They're going to have areas of excessive atrophy. They're going to have areas of severe retinal thinning, and you will want to try to steer clear of those areas. You also want to be at least two millimeters from the center of the fovea. And most of the time, in the, is you're going to select somewhere on the arcade, somewhere about here or here. And that's where your needle is going to go through. Beyond that, you need a plan where your bleb is going to go. So where is that <coughs> subretinal space going to be formed and go to? And realize that you might need to have multiple injections to cover your entire area. Don't think that you have to do all of that uh, treat, desired treatment area with one bleb. Um, also, you need to make sure that you, you decide beforehand if you want to detach the fovea or not. So now we're to the procedure. Um, first, you start with a core vitrectomy which is the first step in most of retinal surgery. They highly recommend injecting dilute trimcillin um, to show the cortical vitreous and aid in creating a PVD. Many of these patients are young and have very adherent PVDs to atrophic thin retina. And so we'll look at some videos showing that. This is also a normal step. They recommend using the soft tip and a, or a membrane scraper, scraper or the flex loop. Um, oftentimes here we just use the protractor. So this is one of their videos, and that's the triessence going in. They're doing their core vitrectomy, and now they've jumped forward, and they're using the flex loop to open a little opening in that cortical vitreous. Then they'll engage the side of it with the flex loop and very gently elevate the cortical vitreous off the macula. And you see it propagate through the nerve. They continue to move it nasally, and then they'll switch to the vitrector and clean up the gel. So the next video is one from the Moran. This was actually a retinal detachment in a 22-year-old, and we just used the triacin sustain and using the cutter to elevate and induce a PVD. All right, so interrupt. Um, you've induced the PVD. Now you need to prepare to make the pre-bleb. And what you're going to use is a 10cc VFC syringe filled with BSS, and it's really important not to have air bubbles. You're going to mount an extendable 23-gauge, 41-gauge subretinal needle, and then manually prime it to get any, need, any air out of the system. You'll then connect the tubing to the vitrector, and you're going to adjust the VFC infusion pressure to 20 millimeters of mercury. And then you're going to engage it with the foot pedal, push out any dead space, and you'll get a jet of fluid coming out of the needle. But you actually don't want a jet of fluid, you want a steady drip. <coughs> and so you'll lower the pressure to 10 or 12, and then slowly increase that pressure until you have a very slow and steady drip from the tip of the 41 gauge needle. You don't want any jetting because any turbulent flow in the subretinal space can be problematic. You saw briefly before, they cut the, the tip of the needle at 45 degrees to give it a little bit of sharpness, and then they switch out the 25 gauge trocar for a 23 gauge valved or valveless, and they typically use a valveless trocar because you're infusing enough fluid, they want there to be egress through the cannula. Retract the tip, um, insert it, and reprime in the vid mid vitreous, making sure there's no air bubbles. So then you're gonna go back to your treatment plan, make sure you know exactly what you're trying to detach and, um, and where you wanna put the needle. You're gonna position the intraoperative OCT and there's two line scans. There's a horizontal line scan and a vertical line scan. The horizontal line scan needs to be going through the horizontal plane where the needle's gonna go into the subretinal space. The vertical line scan needs to be adjusted so that it's, uh, the slice is going through the fovea. Because the fovea is the most likely place that when you're doing this injection, there's going to be a traumatic hole formation. 
And so you want the assistant and yourself to be very aware of what's happening. If that starts to become eccentric or extend, you need to stop injecting. We'll show you what happens uh, when you don't do that. And you're then going to engage the tip into the retina while you're watching on OCT. You're going to pay attention to see if you see choroidal blanching in the microscope and also to see on the OCT if you're indenting the RPE layer. If you're indenting the RPE layer, you've gone too deep and you're, you need to back up. You're then going to slowly inject. Normally it takes about five to seven seconds to create a bleb. And um, you're going to confirm this all with OCT. Um, so let's look at some of these pictures. This is this the photo intraoperatively showing where the needle is. In the top scan, it actually looks like the needle is in an appropriate position and they're shadowing. However, you can see in the horizontal scan, sorry, in the vertical scan, that there's a depression in the RPE. If they were to inject right now, this would cause choroidal hydration and not subneurosensory retinal hydration. This is what you're trying to do. This is a perfect blood that was formed after seven seconds. And this is going to be the spot, uh, and this is with BSS, not the viral vector, to clarify. Um, but this doesn't always happen. If you go too deep, you get choroidal hydration. So this is suprachoroidal injection, and this is subretinal injection. They say it's very common. Don't get too upset. Go find a new place and find your subretinal space. Um, this is just a cool footage showing where the needle had gone through um, into that subretinal space. And again, choroidal hydration, subretinal <laughs> hydration. These are all too deep. Now, if you look, if you were not deep enough, you can get intraretinal hydration, which is the cyst that had been formed. Um, but they went back and they made an appropriate subretinal injection here. So this is them showing how it's a little bit challenging. They're, they're, ma they're manipulating the OCT so that they can get the vertical scan, which is on the bottom, through the fovea. You can see the fovea. And the horizontal scan is going to be in the plane where they're going to do the injection. Right now, they're still just inspecting. Needles in the eye and primed, ready to go. They're going to slowly lower the needle down. And you'll see it come into the OCT um, pretty soon. And what they're saying is, you really got to pay attention to the fovea, because as it detaches, it will stretch. And you don't want to overstretch that, or you'll cause um, a macular hole. So the fluid's about to start injecting. There's some hydration, and there's the blood formation. Again, this is BSS, not the viral vector. They're just creating a space for the viral vector to be injected. You see the fovea, it looks pretty thin to me, but they're saying that's what it normally looks like when you're doing this step. If you inject too quickly, or if bubbles come in at the wrong time, bad things can happen, like a hole through the fovea. Look right here. So that, you can see all the subretinal fluid coming out through the fovea. And the problem with this is not just that you have macular hole, we fix those regularly. The problem is once there's a hole of that size, you can't inject the viral vector because if you were to inject the viral vector, it's just going to egress out through that hole and it, you're not going to achieve the gene therapy you desired. Um, and you can see that the problem was these air bubbles. All right. And as, as we talked about, go with more blebs, not a bigger bleb. So if you're having trouble getting the spaces you want, go and create more bloods. Now, uh, I'm going to go through this quick because I know we're getting low on time. Um, when you prepare the vector, it's very similar to what we talked about with the BSS and the 10cc, but it's a 1cc syringe with an adapter that also can be controlled by the VFC um, pedal with the vitrector. So essentially the same thing. And um, now we'll talk about actually injecting the viral vector into the subretinal space. There is the option to do a straight subretinal injection without the BSS step. Um, the people that publish this article recommend against that because you have a very limited volume of viral vector and that it's not always straightforward to get the blood created. And so you can actually run out of viral vector before you've actually achieved the treatment that you want. And so using BSS first is uh, the preferred way to go. And this uh, will be the first injection, so there's a bleb. Uh, you can see that on the OCT, and the needle will come in. You can see it shadowing right now. They're going to enter that space, and here it goes. And what's going to happen is it's going to fail to progress to the fovea, and they wanted to get a subfoveal treatment. And that's probably because you'll see in just a second, 
when they go to inject again, boom, there, here comes an air bubble. So once the air bubble was in, they thought it was too risky to keep injecting, and they actually decided to just go make a, another bleb along the inferior arcade and then connect those two blebs. So we'll skip where they go and do the second bleb and to show you what it looks like once they start injecting the second bleb. So now they're along the inferior arcade. They have this nice big bleb that's adjacent to the fovea, and they'll go um, into that space. The needle's going into the subretinal space, and then they're going to inject, and they're going to deliver the viral vector. They recommend that 0.3 milliliters be injected into the subretinal space. Um, do not inject that much simply to do it. Um, if you're seeing signs that there might be thinning of the retina or you're going to induce a whole stop injecting. This is the, a video just showing the direct injection of the viral vector, which kind of looks like just doing the BSS. It also highlights something. Without the OCT, as it wasn't provided with this video, it's really hard to know where that needle is. So if you're in the choroidal space, or you're in the intraretinal space, or you're in the preretinal space, it's just very difficult. Um, but you'll start to see there's really low elevation right now, and that low elevation will progress to the macula. But without intraoperative OCT, this would be uh, exceedingly diff difficult to do reliably. Now you're really starting to see that buggle form, and the edge is going to progress to the fovea. All right, so final steps, you do the sclerodepressed exam, make sure there's no tears, treat it with laser if you need to. And in all the trials so far, they've done an air fluid exchange. They're not sure this is absolutely necessary, but um, that was part of the protocol. For post-operative care, you position them supine for two to 24 hours, even if the eye is air filled. You continue the oral prednisone for 21 to 60 days, and you're gonna taper after the first two <coughs> weeks. You're just going to prescribe routine topical antibiotics, and then you're going to get a macular OCT as soon as you can see the macula, so uh, once the air is gone. And you're going to assess for resolution of that fluid. You're going to perform your multimodal imaging and your normal visual acuity, um, in addition to micropermetry and ERG, to see how the patient's responding. And um, you'll see how they do. So putting it all together, this is going to be a video from uh, Dr. Davis that is on AAO's website, and it's just everything in sequence. So triessence, stain the gel, core, lift the PVD. And while this is a pretty common step that we do all the time in retina surgery, in these patients, it's not always straightforward. All right, they got their PVD. Now they're going to move to their BSS bleb. There it is. They're just explaining that it's optional and you don't have to do this step. And here comes the viral vector. And you can see that it's now underneath the fovea, and that was their treatment goal. All right, and so with that, we can have a couple quick questions, and then we'll hand it over to Eric to take us home. So just uh, one comment I just wanted to make <coughs> is that right now, as we're starting to participate and recruit patients for gene therapy, they are being done generally at centers of excellence, so our patients would have to be referred elsewhere. When we start with Greg Hageman and <coughs> Stefan and the other people here, we will probably, AMD, the intention is to do these gene therapies here. And, but we're also part of trials. The trials that will happen this year are gonna be intravitreal, and we're gonna be part of phase one and two. We're gonna be one of the first two sites in the world to be doing that for choroid remand, actually, DARP. 
Any quick questions here? Okay. Well, we will go to Eric next. Cost and ethical considerations. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So I'm Eric Hansen. I'm also one of the Retina Fellows. I think most people know me by now. Um, I can't leave. So uh, we've kind of zoomed in. We've done all the, um, both looked at how we make the viral vectors, what the gene therapies that are kind of coming down the pipeline that are already here. And so I'm gonna zoom out and take a kind of a societal perspective on what these mean. Um, Cause there are some special considerations, both from an economic, but also maybe some ethical considerations uh, as we deliver care as, as uh, physicians that, um, that are important to at least discuss amongst us. And they've already been kind of discussed in the literature already. And I think they will continue to be so. I have no financial disclosures or connection to these, any of these drugs. Um, so I think that, you know, if you've been paying attention at all to the um, news cycles, even, um, especially related to the, the upcoming uh, primaries and elections, um, healthcare costs are kind of becoming, not becoming, they have become a really important um, talking point and something that's affecting a lot of people. Uh, insurance premiums are continuing to rise and uh, healthcare costs have continued to grow pretty steadily, both as a percentage of the GDP, but also just as a raw number. And it is something that people feel is necessary to rein in and address. Um, I don't have the, a graphic up here, but one, one way of looking at the, uh, the rise of insurance premiums is about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, there was only a few states that the insurance premium was 10% of someone's income. And now, pretty much every state that people's, um, when you look across the country, that that's true, that is the above the average. Um, and so this is just to kind of focus us into gene therapy, which uh, the first FDA approved gene therapy was Luxterna. And so it was the, people were really eager to see uh, how it would enter the market and its pricing. And it entered the market with a really high cost. Um, does anybody know the cost off the top of their head? Yeah, so um, almost, uh, so 425 is about 850 for both eyes, and both eyes um, are done as part of the protocol. So about an $850,000 price tag for the one-time treatment. And around the same time, the U.S. Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, which is um, uh, supposedly a non-biased um, organization, kind of came out with a cost analysis that said that this probably wasn't cost-effective. Um, the reason this was port important is because, as I kind of just mentioned, there's a lot of gene therapies that are coming down into the phase three and were also being released shortly thereafter. And they were looking to look sooner and what the reaction was to determine um, what pricing was be, because this is a very expensive therapy to produce. The viral vectors are much more expensive than other kind of molecular um, therapies that we're used to. Um, and so, uh, in the next couple of years, a few more gene therapies came out. Two of them um, in the European markets were actually so expensive they were taken off the market. The, the, the markets and the government decided that they weren't worth it. Um, and then a $2.1 million drug uh, came out. This is for, uh, not for an ophthalmology disease, this is for spinal uh, muscular atrophy. And that's a $2.1 million one time treatment. So, all that to say is there's a valid question of are these treatments? Uh, worth this kind of cost to society for orphan disease, orphan disease being rare diseases in this case that affect a small number of people. Um, and are the, the, are the data for the clinical trials showing that the effect of the gene, that the efficacy of the gene uh, therapy is high enough to warrant it as well? Um, so how do you answer this question? Well, one way to do it is through a public health analysis, and I won't get too much in the weeds with public health uh, theory, but um, and I think most people will know these terms, but I just wanted to kind of go through some terms that uh, are important for the rest of my talk. Um, so when you look at uh, public health and the cost, effect cost effectiveness of something, of a therapy, I'll often it's termed in, in, uh, in relation to quality adjusted life years. So quality adjusted life years is just the multiplication of the number of years that something affects or, at, uh, or the lifespan if it's a lifelong uh, effect times a health-related quality of life, which is kind of set by validated metrics. Um, the Markov model is what has been used in a lot of these studies, 
And all that says is basically that the transition from one state uh, to another is only um, dependent on the state you're in. So for example, in this one, which is looking at uh, neovascular um, wet AMD, uh, wet AMD neovascular uh, macular degeneration, if uh, somebody has a stroke, for example, in the study, then therefore they're, um, from there on, it only depends on the stroke. Or if you've created health states or transition states for vision, once they go from one visual state to another, it only depends on them being in that state. It's only important for uh, how it's modeled. It doesn't really um, come into play much more. And then cost effectiveness is the idea that we're trying to um, budget limited resources in our healthcare system. And so we're trying to th do, uh, pick things that are both um, not too costly, but also very effective. Um, and when anything is imbalanced on one of those two scales, they might not be uh, the best choice for a society in treating a disease. And then the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, effectiveness ratio is the idea that for one therapy versus another, if it gets, you get one more quality adjusted life years, how much did that one additional quality adjusted life year cost you? So that's the incremental. All right, so to look at kind of where eye disease or visual um, impairment is, um, is how it's valued um, from a public health perspective, I have this table. And it's actually quite striking if you look at it. So um, this comes from a data, that, uh, a study that's later presented about cataract surgery. Um, but when you see someone who's had bilateral cataract surgery, their utility, so uh, health-related utility is from a one to basically a zero scale, one being the perfect life, zero being death. So it's near one, 0.97. Um, what's interesting is you look like someone's just had one eye done, unilateral cataract surgery, and they've, it's raked below a mild stroke, below treated HIV, below impotence. I might argue with that. But <laughs> you then go down to somebody who hasn't yet had cataract surgery, and they're 2080 in both eyes. 2080 for retina is people we see quite commonly, and for these therapies would be... Um, quite applicable as some of the cutoff vision was 2060 um, in some of these studies. So they is still ranked as less than having to have dialysis at home, having AIDS with a CD4 count of less than 50, having MI with moderate effect. Point being, to sum it up, visual um, impairment or visual function is very heavily weighted in these um, cost-effective analysis because we know what basically what it's saying is if you have 2080 vision, your whole life will in some way be affected. Your whole lens of how you perceive or interact with your life is affected by your vision. Whereas everything else has kind of a more of a seesaw pattern and that's why it's rated that way. So as um, Luxterna was coming out, um, uh, last year they, somebody took the U.S. Um, Institute of e uh, Clinical and Economic Review a statement and they actually uh, published a study on it with the modeling and they concluded um, that overall that this um, that Luxerna or Vortigine was unlikely to be cost effective compared with the standard of care at the current price and at commonly commonly used cost effectiveness thresholds that being usually around 100,000 to 150,000 um, quality adjusted life years uh, per sorry dollars per quality adjusted life years and what they showed is that when you look at the, their modeling, um, and anytime you do a modeling like this, you're doing a, uh, uh, basically a number of simulations. It's called Monte Carlo simulations. So that you, you catch the fact that your, um, your modeling obviously has bias. So you try to simulate it a number of times, and then you can get probabilities and, uh, through that. So if you look at this, what it's showing is that at the willingness to pay threshold, so as I was saying, like 100,000, 150,000 is generally commonly accepted. The probability from either a U.S. healthcare perspective, which means you're just dealing with cost, direct cost, and then a modified societal perspective, which is you include things like lost productivity, uh, government program costs, those kind of indirect costs, that the probability that it'll be cost effective doesn't even uh, reach 10% until you're getting into well over 200, 300,000, and then you can kind of read the, the graph from there. And there, and um, their numbers, which will be important for what the next study I'm going to talk about, show this, that the, the additional quality adjusted life years for the gene therapy was only 1.3 more than standard of care. Okay? How did they determine that? They used, um, uh, and, there's, and this would be some, there would be some uh, 
controversy surrounding this is they used uh, kind of standard visual vision related metrics that were validated for other cost effectiveness models but that have been used for AMD and other uh, ophthalmic diseases, okay? The question being, is that the best for these particular diseases where there's visual field loss, where there's, um, uh, where vision, visual acuity might not be the, the most important thing that you're seeing decline, nyctalopia, other things, and it's a pediatric disease. And then you can also see, so with um, the U.S. direct cost, it's about 650, and when you include the uh, societal perspective, which is, includes indirect cost, it's about 480,000 per quality adjusted life year is, the, um, is what these therapies cost from a public health standpoint. So then, um, just a few months ago in JAMA, there was another uh, study published kind of um, in response which also looked at the cost effectiveness. It changes economic and uh, model and some of the assumptions. So one of the most important things it did was looking at how do you determine the health utility of, of this gene therapy for uh, RPE65 mediated disease. And so they said, well, I don't think the, the normal valid ways of doing it is, is the best way for this. So they used vignettes. They created six trend, uh, health uh, or vision states which were kind of like moderate, severe visual impairment and like uh, hand motion, no light perception. They used an expert panel and they basically came up with their own health utility is essentially what they did. And they also then uh, changed, one thing I didn't address in the previous one is they used uh, their model for duration or durability of treatment was that after three years, you started to have a 10% decline in uh, the, the effect or the, or the durability of the treatment. So people start, they started losing effect after three years. They did that because that was kind of the time frame of the studies at the time. Here they assumed a lifetime horizon for their study. They, uh, based on the theoretical um, implication that these uh, viral vectors and the delivery of these genes in the subretinal space should continue to have effect um, um, for basically indefinitely. And there's, we don't know yet the durability. So that was the basis for their assumption. And then they used a much broader calculation of indirect costs. So um, the things that really kind of stuck out was their inclusion of government programs and programs for the blind from a, a pediatric po population onward were much higher. Um, and with that, and I want you to pay attention just quickly, so they show that the indirect costs is, um, were so different that the incremental value um, if you include in the direct cost, was actually negative. This means there's a return on investment for society. It's quite a different finding. And with direct cost, the, um, um, sorry, oh, it was about uh, 79,000. Sorry, that was looking at that number. 79,000. Um, the, the major points of difference, though, comes to how they valued uh, the, the health utility, where you see there's a, a 10, 9.4 actually, uh, incremental value of health utility compared to 1.3. And then the other major point was the indirect cost. So what do we do with all this? Well, um, one criticism of this is that the, the, val uh, the health utility is not validated. How do we know it? That the duration of treatment, it might not be lifetime. Um, I think that even in the studies, they discuss whether this is gonna, whether you need retreatment, um, whether this, how long is this gonna last, we don't know yet. We have some reliance on animal models. Um, the indirect cost is probably overstated. And then there's no adjustment for the second eye, and actually there's no adjustment in either study where if you get one eye, is this, if you get an equal, exactly equal value for the second eye, probably not, but we don't know um, really how to value that yet, because it's not, it's not the same as cataract surgery. These people are probably more reliant on their bilateral vision than somebody who has uh, a cataract in one eye and got cataract surgery in the other eye. Um, and then these, the people who studied uh, or published this study are um, employees of, of SPARC, which was also um, vaguely problematic, perhaps. So, um, all that to say, I have about five minutes. I want this to be semi-interactive in the last five minutes. How many people think about cost on a regular basis when they're treating patients and cost effectiveness of what they're using to treat. Okay, if I say only cost effectiveness from a public health standpoint, how many, you, how many people would say they regularly, regularly consider that? 
So ophthalmology actually, we're a little bit um, fortunate in that a lot of our treatments are very cost effective. This is something that I uh, encountered a lot when I was in the, doing the uh, global fellowship and um, out there. The, the cost effectiveness from a public health standpoint of cataract surgery is among the best of anything that's offered in medicine. When you're talking about SICS and high volume uh, cataract surgery in Nepal and India, it gets to the point of like four to five dollars per uh, additional quality adjusted life here, which is comparable to immunizations and almost as good as vitamin A supplementation, which is incredibly effective. Within, well, with fake emulsification and with modern cataract surgery here in the United States even, the, the numbers range from anywhere from 1,000 to, there's actually a new study um, that, come, uh, that was published in 2012 that shows that if you include indirect costs, much like that last study of the uh, um, Luxturna gene therapy, that the return on investment is, is something like 4,000% for society for cataract surgery, bilateral cataract surgery. And the metrics there are a little bit more validated, a little bit more uh, robust as far as how they evaluate it. But even when you just take direct cost, it's about $1,600 um, for cataract surgery. It's very good. Um, now let's take something that um, us retina folks do a little bit more, and that's treat uh, neovascular AMD with intravitreal injection. So $50,000 here in this, uh, on this published paper. But it's a little bit more complex. And I want, I want to give this because um, as I come away from the gene therapy, which I, I think maybe is one way of uh, interpreting what I said is that maybe this is, uh, we're not getting a great bang for our buck. I want to kind of show you another thing we do very commonly and we don't think too much about should we be changing on a regular basis. And that's uh, Avastin versus some of the, the um, brand name anti-VEGF therapies. So if you look at this, this was a, um, a comparison of, of bevacizumab versus ranibizumab for cost effectiveness for wet AMD newly diagnosed. And it basically, this is the same thing, the probability. And you could, it, just to sum it up, there's basically very little chance, very little chance, <coughs> that unless you lower the, the cost of ranibizumab <coughs> substantially, that it will ever be more cost effective or as cost effective as giving um, Avastin, either monthly or as needed. And even when you look at outcomes, as needed, bevacizumab is actually more cost effective than monthly or more regular treatment. Is that what we do? Is that how we interpret it? Not really. Um, and then you look at this, this is including the flibercept, and you look at the incremental value, so the same uh, metric that was used for the gene therapy is in the 600,000, 800,000, 500,000 range for using the brand name. Uh, anti-VEGF, Lucentis, and uh, ILEA versus Avastin from a public health perspective. Yet, we all kind of have also have the data that it's more efficacious, um, at least in the short term, and, and, and we use that and our patients know about it, they, you know, they know about these drugs as well, and we, we do see anecdotally better effect, and so we still continue to treat in that way. But I, I offer that as a way of um, I guess, framing the gene therapy. Um, and so, I wanna to get to some questions. All right, so do we have a more obligation to consider cost to the patient? Would everybody say yes? I think so. To society, do we have a moral obligation to be <coughs> stewards of cost and, and how this affects societal costs? No. No, why would you say no? Uh, well, I think because we're not making societal decisions, and so we're, we're, not, we're not driving that. I think our responsibility is to the patient in front of us. Yeah, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you said no, because that allows me to then say, so if we are not, um, and I think there is a valid argument there. There's, a lot, there's very interesting um, uh, literature on, on, on this uh, dichotomy or, or opposition, is how then do we determine these um, uh, decisions? So should this be a democratic process? For example, if you're enrolled in um, a health insurance plan, should there be some kind of democratic process amongst people who are enrolled in it that they determine whether they're gonna accept a high cost therapy or not? Should we do it as a society? I think theoretically we think we do that, but pretty clearly we do not because we're voting on so many, such a, a fragmented and complex uh, healthcare market 
that's all tied up in other health, uh, policies that are not healthcare related. But maybe it, is there some way we could do it democratically? Um, what about like a, a, a rider on your health insurance? So you have to buy into a rider before you have the disease that you, for high cost therapies. For example, cancer medications for metastatic disease are, high, are, are very high cost medications as well, often in the order of a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, should patients have to have a rider in the, so that those insurance uh, plans will cover that in the case they need it? That way it's not passed on to everybody in the plan. Um, and uh, the other question I ask is, in cases where these, these costs are passed on to the patient, this might not be as, uh, as applicable to uh, patients with these particular diseases, because I, I honestly just don't know. We haven't dealt with this. But are there cases where insurance decides they won't pay for it, right? And now that you have a patient who has a million dollar bill for something, is a patient often the parent in these situations in a rational or is that a just position for them to be making that decision that they could be burdened with a million dollar bill and then how that might affect their life going forward. And people who have actually dealt with the insurance implications of this would know better know how to discuss that. So quickly, there's about 1,000 to 2,000, 1,000 to 3,000 depending on the study of RP65 mutation um, or patients with this mutation in the US. It would cost a billion, a billion and a half dollars to deliver this therapy to everybody, which is a small percentage of the total healthcare expenditures, which is in the trillions of dollars. Not everybody would actually be a candidate, but just as theoretical. However, if gene therapy, or as gene therapy becomes more and more uh, prevalent and more and more um, available for other orphan diseases, for other genetic diseases, where does that cost end up blossoming to, or blooming, or uh, bloating too, depending on how you're looking at it. And I think that's what you have to consider uh, when you're talking from a societal perspective, is we could probably do this, it would be a blip in the radar um, to deliver it to everybody, but this sets the, um, the paradigm for how we're delivering care down the road, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, and there are opportunity costs associated with it. So on the basis of time, I'll let that go, but hopefully it was some, some fodder for thought. You guys have a great Wednesday.